Welcome everyone. Just going to give people a minute to join. So today I'm going to talk about uh, large scale scrum, friendly scrum, also known as uh, less friendly scrum. So it doesn't mean uh, it's any less friendly, just large scale scrum friendly. So it's an expression that I use to explain when I'm in an organization and say I'm in there as a coach or a change agent of some sort. Uh, one of the things that can make me nervous is um, when training companies come in and they're basically giving messages that are inconsistent with the way that I operate and the way that I like things to, to proceed. So I want to explain today on this recording uh, and this live stream, uh, feel free to comment. Uh, if you want to come on camera, uh, you can uh, you can WhatsApp me if you want, uh, or you can just uh, do a comment on the, whichever stream you're coming through. And I'd be happy to bring on camera and we can uh, you can ask me some questions uh, directly. Um, so what am I talking about here today? Essentially, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, large-scale Scrum, um, less for short. Uh, large-scale Scrum has been around for well over, I think, well over 11 years now at this stage, probably longer. And uh, it was co-invented, if you like, by uh, Craig Larman and Bas Fada. And uh, it's got a really uh, thriving community. It's... Uh, so it's a pleasure to be part of the community. Uh, I'm a less friendly scrum trainer myself. I'm also a scrum the raw professional scrum trainer. And I also do a lot of work with uh, Kanban and other methods. I'm pretty much agnostic, actually, even though I do a lot of uh, scrum work. So scrum is just part of what I do. But when I'm in, co when I'm, when I'm in companies, um, I, I am nervous about uh, what kind of training is going on, what, what other coaches are saying within the footprint that I'm operating in. So. Um, I like to use uh, less friendly Scrum, and so the the best books uh, to look at for uh, large scale Scrum. Uh, there's three three big fat books, and uh, the one that you probably should start with is the most recent one, uh, large scale Scrum, the Black Book. It's uh, very digestible, very well written, and uh, that's a very good introduction to large scale Scrum. The second book then you should probably look at would be Scaling. Um, scaling in an agile development uh, written by the same uh, writers, authors, and then there's practices as well that go beyond that. They're not for the faint-hearted uh, practices for large scale scrum. So three really decent books on large scale scrum. There's a website there as well, uh, less.works, L-E-S-S dot W-O-R-K-S, and uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, what impact large scale scrum has on the kind of scrum that I hope fellow coaches, fellow change agents, training companies that are coming into the organization that I'm working in, and what kind of messaging are they giving? Are they doing any damage to uh, the messages that I'm, that I'm trying to get out there, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch my camera and I'm going to go to a flip chart. So uh, I'm just gonna go back to my main screen. If you have any comments or questions, please by, uh, put a comment uh, on, on whichever stream you're on, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Periscope, wherever you're coming from. And I'll put the comments up on screen as well, so you can and you can also WhatsApp me if you wanna if you wanna come on camera. So I'm just going to switch my camera now uh, to a flip chart, and uh, we're going to be talking at the flip chart. So, um, okay. So I'll take off the message now, so that you can see more, and I'll just remove the branding as well, so that uh, we get the the full screen and you get the the full benefit, so you can see everything. That I'm talking about. Okay, um, so uh, I'll be keeping out an eye out on, an eye out on the comments, and I'll also be looking at WhatsApp as well. So uh, feel free to to ping me on that. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, let's just put a little bit of light on the subject. Um, so hopefully uh, the flip chart is a little bit more legible now, and I want to just give a little bit of background about where large scale Scrum is coming from. Um, this is just my own view. There's, uh, there's principles that, that uh, underlie large scale scrum. There are frameworks there. You've got the, the less framework, large scale scrum framework, and there's also the less huge framework for uh, on average over uh, roughly eight, over eight teams on, on a single product. Uh, and that can scale thousands of people. But here I'm just going to be talking about the, the plain framework less 
and uh, the scrum that goes along with that. So the first thing I want to talk about is that less in terms of adoption is both top down and bottom up. Um, this is really important. Uh, we do need some support from the top of the organization, but also we need to uh, we need people to volunteer for for this. Uh, we some there's one of the guides that you could do. I'm not sure if it's a guide, but basically an informed consent where if there are maybe thirty or forty people who are interested in t uh, looking at large scale scrum, you might bring those people to a workshop for a week where you do some training on. Scrum, basic Scrum, and then large scale Scrum, and maybe do some uh, system modeling together to understand the system. And some people who have come along to that workshop might not like what they see. They might not be ready for it, or it's it just not, not even about being ready for it, just might not be compatible with their, their views. So uh, very much based on volunteering. So people get invited to a workshop, and those who want to come through, come through. Those who don't um, continue doing what they're doing, even if we desperately depend uh, on those people. So it's important to have respect for people, respect for people who are actually uh, part of the change and respect for people who, uh, you know, who just don't want to be part of it. Um, we also have uh, self-managing teams and self-management is kind of a central tenet really to the entire large scale scrum um, framework and principles uh, because there are no there are zero coordinating roles in large scale Scrum. Uh, one of the things about the Scrum Guide, it's great that we have a Scrum Guide. Um, it kind of unifies uh, a lot of the Scrum practitioners around the world, trainers and coaches and so on. But in, to, in, in certain ways, I, I think uh, you could metaphorically drive a bus through it because there's a lot of things that are very open to interpretation. And uh, that's what we're going to be kind of nailing a little bit better uh, during, this, uh, during this live stream. So uh, what we try to aim for with large scale Scrum, uh, we call them feature teams, but I, I don't use the expression feature team so much anymore. I, I refer to slice of cake teams. So if you think of the metaphor of a cake, uh, you can get a layer of cake, uh, you can get a technical team, component team delivering a layer of cake. Uh, you can't really get any value out of that. So very limited value out of that. But if you get all the layers together, um, you, you know, you can, you, can, you can taste that and you can get some value out of that. So most of, if not all of the teams in large scale Scrum would be slice of cake teams. Um, so sometimes what we do is uh, the concept of a self-designing team workshop. There are uh, some blog posts on that um, and there's some case studies that uh, demonstrate people doing that where essentially managers uh, who are involved as well, managers uh, really go see what's going on and they're there to try and help fix the system. And, Part of fixing the system would be trying to make sure that we have slice of cake teams uh, rather than layer of cake teams. So we might come up with some rules. Um, let's say uh, cognitive diversity, diversity and inclusion. We need a cross-functional team, um, mixture of gray hair, fresh ideas, all those kind of usual. So whatever the criteria are, uh, the managers then leave the room and the change agents, coaches work with the teams and say, well, okay, try to self-organize it. You get a really good scorecard and and some kind of checklist that makes sure that we got a really nice team. And after a number of iterations, I'm not saying it's the easiest thing to do, but after a number of iterations, you end up with uh, new teams. They give themselves a team name, they take a team photograph, and uh, there are the new teams. And if you can plan it well, uh, their desk space will be re rearranged as well so that when they go back uh, post uh, uh, exit lo lockdown, when they go back to their to their desk, they can. Uh, they can basically work as part of the new team. We don't have to wait another few weeks or months for the team to actually sit together. Um, the team, well, a very important concept as well is that the teams would have a whole product view. And this is something that will improve over time. Um, so when we get into describing Scrum later on, when we look at product backlog refinement, not only will teams be looking at the work that they're doing themselves, they'll be, well, they'll primarily be working with other teams in the same area of the product. And so they might be doing product backlog refinement with those teams, but they'll also visit the other teams that they're not even involved with to uh, to be more aware of the work that they're doing. Uh, because who knows, there could be gaps in the thinking. Maybe some of the cognitive diversity will help as well when you spot something that maybe the teams didn't spot themselves. But more important, more importantly, we, we learn more, not just in terms of technical skill, but we're learning, we're learning about the product as well. Um, so, no coordinating roles in large-scale Scrum. Um, 
there are, there are no product owners at team level within a product. So let's say you've got a product with 10 teams, there is just one product owner, one product owner. And some people say, well, how the hell can that happen? How can you have just one product owner across, uh, uh, let's say, 10 teams um, or eight teams, for example? Well, what we do is we expect these uh, self-managing teams uh, to basically do a lot of the uh, a lot of the product backlog refinement with customers and end users because there's more of a focus on the customer and end user in large scale Scrum. So the 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 teams they're, they're not clarifying requirements with the product owner. They're clarifying requirements or actually the clarifying problems because requirement is a bit of a loaded word mean, means everything uh, everything is a must have. So whatever problems that we're trying to solve, they clarify those with the customers and the end users. And so that's kind of interesting. So the product owner then has the space to articulate a, a vision, uh, where are we going with this product, and uh, communicate that vision with the various stakeholders, manage the politics around that, uh, find out what's not being said in the meeting rooms and so on, going for coffee with people and, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, it also means that the, the product owner can just agree uh, every sprint, what we're going to do in, in the next sprint. And so they don't have to be so involved in the day-to-day -day what's going on. There's lots of other product management stuff that needs to do with Scrum as well. And the product owner would typically be a very senior person, probably a, uh, probably an executive. Uh, so they've got the, they, they know where we're going and they've got the budget um, and uh, ideally kind of an entrepreneurial type, uh, type product owner. Um, so if I, if I talked a little bit about the, the bottom, but if I also talk about uh, coming down from the top, um, if we were to pick something that less is kind of helping to improve, uh, I've identified a few areas that kind of a direction of travel, if you like, where less can bring you. And uh, one of those, uh, you can use the word adaptability or adaptiveness. I, like, I think I prefer adaptiveness because that's kind of like being, I am adaptive, we are adaptive already. And so we can respond or even be proactive about what's going on in the market. Whereas adaptability is the ability to adapt. Um, so I just have a slight preference for this version. Uh, um, but that's only a small detail. Uh, we're obviously trying to um, maximize value, value in terms of the market of customers and end users, not just the existing customers, also potentially new customers. Um, uh, I think uh, what we get as well with large scale Scrum is improved inspiration, improved inspiration of employees, of um, stakeholders, customers, end users, shareholders. Um, and I think it's not really what it's all about. Uh, Dr. Lance Sekutan explained to me and uh, an audience two years ago the difference between motivation and inspiration. And he said, if you're motivating people, uh, you're basically trying to get them to do something they don't want to do. You're lighting a fire under them, whether that's a bonus or carrot and stick, whatever. Uh, pick your poison. Motiv motivation is kind of about, you know, you're 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 basically encouraging people to do what they wouldn't normally do. Whereas inspiration, he said, is is more about lighting a fire inside people. And so, I think that's really key, actually, in terms of uh, as you're going forward. How does this all happen? I think this can be a, a real early signal that you're going in the right path, that people really want to be part of this, that we really do have a whole product focus. So we're talking to customers, we're trying to uh, really be, be able to turn very quickly if there's a big change in the market. And just uh, checking the screen there, see if there's any comments. And if anybody wants to come online as well, just let me know. Thank you. Um, so that's what, um, Large scale Scrum is, is, is kind of trying to improve. And then if we look at what's going on from an executive management point of view, uh, we have a, we're aiming for a whole product focus. So the, the product uh, wouldn't be like a, an internal system that really doesn't mean anything to the customer. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's essentially, if you, if you say to somebody outside the company uh, that you're working on X, they know what X is. They know what the product is because they buy it, they use it, or they know people who use it. So as much as possible, we're trying to get a product uh, that is a customer, an external customer will recognize, but also as it, it needs to be practical as well because the, there might be some limits and the metaphor of Microsoft Office well, might kind of break down here. But 
if you think of Microsoft Excel and Microsoft Office, um, they're both products, but Microsoft Office is a broader definition of the product. And so one of the things that we try to do over time as we're continuously uh, improving uh, in large scale Scrum, we're trying to expand uh, not only the definition of done in Scrum, the kind of way we do work around here, but also expanding the product definition, also expanding not just the technical skills within these teams, but the business domain skills. And that kind of comes for free actually, when you've got self-managing teams doing product backlog refinement with customers and end users. Um, we have this um, perfection goal as well, which uh, uh, Baswada re referred to in his three-day classes, the almost impossible perfection vision. So I kind of latch on to that expression. Um, so even if something's impossible, it doesn't mean you, you, you shouldn't strive for it. So as well as, you know, having the overall kind of direction here in terms of adaptiveness, uh, we're we're also kind of we're we're also trying to aim for a for, for a place where ultimately every team is a slice of cake team. Uh, they're delivering a product every sprint and strongly use sprints uh, that is potentially shippable, and you can actually release it to the market. That would be difficult initially when you've got tens and hundreds of, te of teams, um, but because in the less huge framework, we we kind of deal with that. But if you are continuously improving, and there's a there's an extra event, uh, if you like, in, in large scale scrum called the overall retrospective, where managers uh, and representatives of teams and the product owner and uh, scrum masters uh, try to continuously improve, uh, fix problems in the system. For example, maybe uh, we need to uh, have better career paths. So when you go into these scrum teams. Is it a two-year dead-end career path, or you, you know, do you have a new forty-year career path? Uh, how do you get rewarded? Um, uh, how how do you how do you get a pay increase? Um, how does work get funded? So these are all things. These will be problems, if you like. That were there weren't so much problems in the old world, the twentieth-century world, but in the new world that we're going to, where we want to be adaptive, a lot of our policies will be constraining us, and so uh, by continuously improving towards that perfection vision of slice of cake teams with a whole product focus, talking to customers with a, a product increment that's been delivered every sprint that's actually getting released to the market. Um, that's uh, that's a great thing, great thing to actually strive, uh, strive for. Um, also, I would say that um, managers uh, need to really go see, uh, really, really go see. There's a fantastic book called The Lean Manager by Ballet and Ballet, uh, which I think is right up there with the goal from Theory of Constraints. I'm not sure why people don't talk so much about The Lean Manager. It's really, really good. I really recommend that you have a look at it. And in there, you have examples of managers who think they see things, but actually they don't really see what the problems are. So until you, until you, know what, until you really see what's going on, you can't really fix the system that the teams are operating in. So you actually need to... Uh, get as involved as possible. In fact, I would say that for a lot of executives, a lot of senior leaders, the journey here over time is that essentially you're going to be rolling up your sleeves every week, every day, actually fixing problems so that the whole system can get better. And we've got some nice thinking tools as well in uh, large scale Scrum to kind of help you with that system modeling. I was doing one only yesterday uh, for a client in Vienna and uh, it's, uh, there's lots of other thinking techniques that will really help you to get better. The other thing I just want to say as well, just stealing a, a quote from uh, Russell Ackoff. Uh, he said, um, if you're doing uh, the right or you do the wrong thing, the wrong or you become. Um, so uh, large scale scrum is less about efficiency. although you do get that as a secondary benefit. It's more about being effective. Are we building the right product? Are we doing the right thing? And I'll explain more about that as we uh, go through the rest of this live stream. Um, so I don't see any comments or questions so far, but I am keeping an eye on your comments. So feel free to uh, to uh, give me some comments if you have any, and I'd be delighted to answer any of your questions. Uh, thank you. Okay, so th these are the, some of the ideas uh, where large scale scrum is coming from. Technical excellence is something that we expect from our teams as well, that if they're software teams, for example, they're automating their tests, if they're marketing and sales teams, uh, they're being really proficient, they're complying with all their rules, but they're trying to find a better way uh, to be compliant with the, the regs, uh, the, the laws and the regs that um, they're operating within, and also the, the policies of the company. So 
there's a continuous attention attention to excellence and that's kind of supported by the definition of done in scrum so every time you deliver something does it comply with our uh, definition of done have we got it has some product quality standards and also some technical uh, considerations in there so that's uh, uh, large scale scrum there are three fat books as i mentioned earlier on uh, there's a three-day course uh, for certified less practitioner uh, where you go really really deep into large-scale scrum this is just like how long was that uh, 20 minutes just uh, talking about large-scale scrum just now going what i want to do next is i want to talk about some of the principles that go behind uh large-scale scrum well not sorry not principles but some of the considerations shall we say uh that come in when i'm uh using large-scale scrum so there's a few uh, principles I want to talk about here. One of them is um, while it's okay to have projects, we know we all have projects in, in organizations. There's this thinking error that we need to set up a, a scrum team for every project. There's a couple of issues with that. Um, the first issue is that even if we've got loads of money and we set up a, a team for each, uh, for each uh, project, Ultimately, all of those projects might be depending on some central team. There might be some team that is like basically a constraint. Um, and so we can't go any faster than that team. So uh, there's a danger that we think we can scale our way and just deliver as many projects as we, as we want to. But actually, we got li there's limits to growth. It's one of the system thinking ideas that there can be limits to growth. So I'm going to show you uh, on the next page how we deal with projects. What we try to do is instead of talking about fixed scope. I mean, I know projects aren't always about fixed scope, but there tends to be a trend for fixed scope, fixed date, uh, and cost, and so on. We aim for more of a product view, a customer value view. And not just products aren't the be all and end all either. You can also uh, take a customer jobs to be done a lens on this as well. So uh, Kristen, Clayton Christensen, he died a couple of months ago from leukemia. He's got a great video, the milkshake video. If you haven't seen it, uh, please check it out. And a fantastic example where uh, customers actually uh, struggle to articulate what they really want. And um, uh, we might talk more about that later on. Uh, we try to de-emphasize uh, specialist roles. Um, uh, that's, this seems to be the biggest problem that I come across. We've got these, uh, uh, these specialists who are kind of needed in every product. And um, we can't get anything done because of that. And they're wonderful people. And uh, it's very, very interesting. It's, but it's really better to be doing this with teams. So instead of, you know, if I use the metaphor of football teams uh, uh, in Europe, I know the leagues are stopped at the moment, the Champions League, for example. I'm, I'm a Man United fan for my sins. We're not doing very well uh, the last few years. But um, I really admire what Liverpool have been doing, what Jurgen Klopp has been doing, because he's basically been building teams. Uh, he building a team. And uh, he was really brave last summer. He, uh, I don't think he did any major uh, player purchases. I don't like to use the word purchase. Uh, he didn't get. He didn't acquire um, many key uh, key players last year. I think there were some loans converted and stuff like that, but no, no major change. So sometimes you've got a good team, you kind of don't mess with it. Um, and so instead of like you know, uh, if we get these star players, you know everything would be wonderful. And uh, that that's actually. A, a thinking error as well that um, uh, heroes are the, are the answer. Heroes actually want to lead to a lot of problems uh, because they don't they, they don't usually stay around for that long. They're either be burnt out or uh, you know it just gets too difficult for them. But more importantly, you're just not you can't get much done. So it's better to do multi learning so that you can get teams to do this. And there's a very popular practice called mob programming, which is now being converted to mob uh, remote mobbing. Woody Zool is a very generous guy with his time. And uh, he often says on LinkedIn, I'm in Europe this week or I'm in North America this week. And if anybody wants to remote model, I'm happy to facilitate. So uh, please reach out to him. So instead of uh, this dependency on key individuals, slowly, slowly you get teams operating as a unit and trying to get the synergy from that as well. And so instead of resource thinking, you know, I, I hear it here in resources, you, uh, what, what's the expression? Uh, um, you call me a resource and I'll call you an overhead, something like that. Um, uh, so instead of resourcing, it's about people thinking and, and having a supportive organizational context. And instead of uh, organizing around layers of cake, 
uh, we try to organize our own slices to create our own customer value. So we try to create that enabling structure. And just on enabling structure, there's a very good book as well uh, by Richard Hackman. He died a few years ago as well. And uh, he studied teams in the US federal agencies. He's got a fantastic book called Leading Teams. And in that book, uh, from his research, I don't have the exact numbers now, but essentially if I had a team that I was supposed to help as a coach, um, on, I think on average I'd have a 10% impact, uh, 10%. Um, but if you, if you set up the teams in the right way, with the right structure, so proper sites of cake, whole product view, um, that has a 60% um, factor, I guess, in terms of the success of the team. Another 30% is how well is the team launched. And then the remainder is like, you know, maybe coaching improvements over time. So um, this there's a thinking here that, you know, we should organize our own specialist skills. I mean, there is a benefit to that. Uh, because, you know, the people on the back end, for example, know the people uh, in the in brand management know exactly what they're doing and so on. Um, but it's it's better for the customer if we design the organization for the customer so we can respond to what they're looking for in, in, a, in a more quick way. So Richard Hackman, Leading Teams, fantastic read if you want to you check that out. You can see a few comments coming in as well. Thank you, Matthew. Welcome and thank you for joining. I'm going to read your comments uh, shortly. Also, uh, we have, instead of having independent teams, we go for cross-team cooperation, or I would even say cross, continuous cross-team collaboration even, because sometimes there's people you don't even know, right? But I guess this is the benefit of operating within the, within the Dunbar number, or less than 150 people. Most people try to keep it down for around 50 people. But for those teams to be continuously cross-cooperating, cross-collaborating, really they need some kind of compelling direction that they're going in. And to the point I made earlier on about there being some benefits to having to be an organizer on technical skills, well, to offset the loss of technical excellence, if you like, in terms of the specific skill that you're working on there, what we what we do is when we have got slice of cake teams, we've got experts who are kind of coming in from the side and they're or they're actually in teams. And so I might be an expert on one thing and uh, I hate to call myself an expert, but I hope you get the idea that, you know, it might be uh, a leading developer or a leading marketing brand person. And uh, when other people are picking up that work, they'll try to do it themselves, of course. Um, but they might ask for my help if they struggle. And so it's good to have some expert mentoring as well. That's uh, that, that's a kind of a, uh, a recommendation as well when you when you do large scale scrum. And for the software people out there, instead of uh, coordinating to integrate, well, there's coordination to integration. So a lot of people say, well, we, we've got Jenkins or we've got whatever kind of tool they have to integrate this off. They might have it installed, but like the, the exam question is, you know, when, when the bill when the bill last broke, uh, did you treat it like an emergency or, you know, has it been broken for the last two weeks or two months even? Um, so just be careful with that one. You might think you've got continuous integration when you install a tool, but actually maybe it's about the behavior. It's about how we make sure that our product is always potentially shippable. And instead of um, many small products, uh, we go for a few broad products. So to my earlier point, uh, a product, the product should be really something that the customer can relate to, um, not some kind of internal systems. I, I sometimes call it hashtag fake products. We, we have these product teams, but actually they're just internal systems that external customers, I'm sure, depend on them to work so that their, their whole value chain works. But um, uh, to all intents and purposes, the customer doesn't really care about those internal systems. So try to make to make the products more um, more customer uh, customer focused. So I'm just going to look at a couple of the comments uh, on screen here. So thank you, uh, Matthew, for coming in. Um, so I have a question. So I'm just going to show it. Um, thank you, Matthew. So far, so good. Um, what's your take on ever new frameworks? I find less. A mix of Nexus and bits of Safe. By the way, you wrote a brilliant comparison on Less uh, and Nexus a few years ago. Thank you, Matthew, for that comment. Um, I did um, a comparison of all of the frameworks that I knew of in 2018 at um, A-Start Works. Um, just uh, put that uh, in the uh, in the comment there. So A-Start Works, and it was called Mirror Mirror. As the, I call it the Mirror Mirror series. So basically, Mirror Mirror on the wall, who is the most whatever of them all? 
and uh, I did a comparison of all those frameworks. And and what I did was um, I assumed that each framework was implemented in the best way possible. I did that because, let's face it, uh, when you implement some framework, uh, the, uh, the level of uh, doing it badly is almost infinite, isn't it? So, um, so if you look at the blog on Ace.Works Mirror Mirror series, there's actually five posts there where I compared um, uh, all the frameworks I was aware of, like Safe, Scrum at Scale, Spotify, if you call it Spotify, um, Prince2 Agile, Nexus, Less, uh, the whole kick and boot that I was aware of at the time. Uh, I think it became aware of Xscale afterwards, uh, although I don't hear much talk about Xscale these days. Um, and uh, yeah, so what I did was, instead of saying one framework is better than the other and all that kind of thing, what I did was I picked nine key measures. And so what you do is you, you decide for yourself and for your organization which of these um, vectors uh, are more important for my organization? And then what you can do is you can look at, okay, if, if those are the vectors that are more important, like, for example, I had the, the three ways from the DevOps community were in there, autonomy, alignment. And so if autonomy and alignment are very important to you, some frameworks would come up higher uh, than others. Um, so basically, uh, what I'm doing is I'm not saying one framework is better than the other, although you will see in the visualization that some probably are. Uh, but there's no point in saying one is better than the other when actually your organization might only be able for certain frameworks anyway. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but basically Ace.Works. And so there's the go to the blog on Ace.Works, and there's a mirror, mirror series. I'm just uh, putting that into the comment section now. And in there, you'll see a preamble. And in the preamble, uh, just say here as well, please read the preamble. Uh, please read the preamble. And the preamble, that's where I actually compare them all. And then I go through the benefits of all those frameworks from another lens as well in the subsequent four-part series comparing all those frameworks. So, but please read the preamble post as well as um, the four main posts uh, in that series. Okay. Um, just, uh, just looking at your question as well to see if I've answered that properly. In terms of uh, Nexus and Less, uh, they are very similar. Uh, one of the key differences um, is, I guess, there's a body of knowledge behind large-scale Scrum around organization design. Uh, there is something similar called Scrum Studio from Scrum.org that supports Nexus, but the body of knowledge is a bit deeper uh, with large-scale Scrum. Um, Nexus, though, is, um, is more forgiving. Because if you're in a situation where you can't, um, it, for whatever reason, can or can't, or is, is an opinion actually, rather than a fact. Um, but if for some reason or another, you think you can't get to slice of cake teams in your company, the Nexus framework is really elegant because it uses this pattern called a Nexus integration team. So what you can do is you can get a member of each development team to be part of the Nexus integration team. They don't actually do the integration. It was named very badly. I think they should have called it a coaching team, but maybe that's not a great name for it either. But essentially what they do, they're worried about at the end of the sprint, uh, will we have a potentially releasable increment? And will we, um, uh, they're also worried about dependencies as well. Now, how do we reduce dependencies? In large scale scrum, we don't have to worry about dependencies so much because We've got slice of cake teams, so we we can deliver something of value within our teams. And because of the multi learning, when we do product backlog refinement, when we look at other teams uh, part of the product backlog that they're refining, that helps us to build the whole product view that we don't get so much with Nexus. But I did write a comparison. It's on uh, Scrum.org. If you just uh, look for John Comb, you'll find that. And thank you very much for that comment, Matthew. And a follow up question from Matthew: Is there anything new? that I've discovered since I did that research. Yes, there is something, I'm not sure if it's new, but the, the wording in the 2018 version of the Nexus guide, I actually missed something. I have to be honest, when it came out, I didn't notice this, uh, but uh, I thought I saw in the earlier version of Nexus uh, that there was this, maybe I just read it the wrong way, but that there would be at least one representative of each a development team on the Nexus integration team, whereas that was made a bit more vague in the 2018 version. It just said there would be representatives from the teams. It didn't necessarily say that there would be one 
per each team. So I think Nexus is getting a bit more flexible. Um, and uh, I think that's the only major thing that I've noticed since then. There was a lot of commonality between the two of them. And Bas Vada actually said, and he wrote a you know, comment that we were able to include in the post, that he sees Nexus as Les's little brother, which I thought it was a nice, a nice comment. So Nexus is good if you're in a place where you still have layer of cake teams. Uh, you can even use it with slice of cake teams, but um, I'd probably be going more towards less if you're already at the stage where you're having slice of cake teams because it's got so much meat on the bone in terms of uh, organization design and scaling to hundreds and thousands of people and uh, Nexus would be a bit more limited in that regard. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Matthew. Okay, so if anybody wants to um, come online, they can they can do so. They can just uh, WhatsApp me. So I'm just going to uh, put a banner there. You can just uh, send me a message, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll send you a link uh, so that you can come on camera, or you can just uh, add some comments on the live stream. So thank you for that. I'm going to go back to the flip chart now, and I'm going to look at a picture of Scrum and. Uh, I think all of you understand what Scrum is. We're just going to align what Scrum is. And then I'm going to zone in on when trainers come in and when other coaches come in, what am I really watching for? What do I want them to not mess up when they're coming in, helping me invert the comments but actually making things worse? So uh, that's where I'm going to zone in on next. Uh, so I'll keep an eye on the comments as well. But I'm going to go back to the flip chart now. Okay. So... Flip chart number three. This is a very complicated diagram, but I'm going to uh, go through it very slowly. Actually, I'll take the banner off because I think I'm blocking the screen there, so I'll be able to see more now. And so this is my visualization of Scrum, and I'm going to walk through it very, very slowly. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to explain how projects can be dealt with in Scrum without having project teams. Because a lot of people think, oh, great idea, let's... Oh, we have a new project. Uh, we're going to be uh, going to be working for three weeks. Yeah, let's do Scrum. I say, really? Uh, I often draw this kind of J curve thing. You might have seen it before, uh, where the horizontal axis is elapsed time, calendar time, and the the, the vertical axis is an improvement or performance. And um, let's say the performance is here, and you're here, and you want to get to here. Um, a lot of people have seen the J curve before, but when you implement a change, even Scrum, uh, especially Scrum. Uh, performance could actually uh, disimprove, was likely to dis disimprove in the short term. Um, and I was caught with that in 2012. Uh, I learned that the hard way. Uh, I had a team previously using Waterfall. Okay, there were lots of misperceptions as well because they thought work was done, which I wasn't done. We'll get to done later on in this uh, conversation. But uh, in my experience, this is just my experience, uh, to get the performance to come back to where it was takes about two months. About two months. And to really get to a place where you really are excelling and you're hitting that point that you want to get to, typically four months. That's just my experience. You might be much better coaches, scrum masters than me, but typically my experience is a bit of a dip for two months. If you manage the dip well, it doesn't dip so much. If you uh, if you uh, if you don't manage, if you don't even expect it to happen, it could be like a car crash. It gets really really bad. And I use some bad language. Uh, ben Maynard did a lovely uh, blog on that, and there's an F word, the F it point. Uh, so you reach that point and then you realize, okay, we either ditch the change or we're going to try and implement it and we, we go ahead with it. So like, why would you have a, a team together for three weeks doing that? I mean, maybe if you're a bunch of Navy SEALs or something, really high capable team, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. But you could just use empiricism, just meet every day maybe, yeah. Um, the, also, what's even more disappointing is when a project team is together for say eight months and they're performing really, really well. Uh, I had a team in... Uh, 2010, uh, yeah, 20, 2009 to uh, 2010. And uh, it was the second highest performing team I ever had until 2019. And uh, we disbanded the team after eight months because there was no more money. If you think about it, a project is an artificial construct to get money to get some work done. And I love a quote from, a quotation from uh, Baz, uh, Baz Vada from the uh, Large Scale Scrum community when I was at his three day class in San Francisco a few years ago. He said, a product doesn't have scope. So, oh, that kind of makes sense. A product doesn't have scope. Um, so the product kind of lives on for many years, isn't it? So, um, so projects are okay, but I'm going to say, okay, so if I don't like setting up a team for a project, how do I do it? 
So I'm going to illustrate that now. Um, so here I've got a product backlog. And on the product backlog, I've got items with different colors. And the colors reflect uh, the source of the item. Uh, there's a product owner here. Um, I used to draw a person with a hat, but I thought it looked a bit too masculine. And then I drew a person with a kind of a queen's crown, and but then it looks superior. So I, I probably need to work on the product owner uh, visualization. But the product owner um, has to engage with stakeholders. We, we understand that. they. They articulate a, a vision uh, that we all aim for, and then they have to consult with the external customers and end users, and they've got a list as long as you're arm, right? They've won loads of stuff to, to get done. Um, but the product owner is only saying yes to some of these items and saying no to others. And even when she's saying yes to these, she's not saying you're going to get these. She's saying, well, at this point in time, based on the information that I have, um, I'm going to put onto the product backlog. So those items are represented as the green items on the product backlog. So far, so good, right? So the external customer stuff is there. And thankfully, this product owner is pretty customer focused. Uh, there's a lot of green stuff on the product backlog. And uh, But then we have some internal projects as well. I just kind of made these up. I presume a lot of companies have COVID-19 projects going on. Uh, I think, uh, do they have scope? I don't know. Is that, is that a long-term thing? I don't know. But it's, uh, there's, there's an emergency, or there might be some regulation, might be some legal regs, and I don't know. You might be in finance industry, or uh, uh, or Brexit, for example, for people in the UK. Um, uh, there's some work that needs to be done on Brexit as well. And so you got these, and, and these could be project managers, right? And so you got the COVID-19 project manager, and they're actually using, they're using whatever their own approach, whatever that is. It's not Scrum so much. Uh, equally here with this uh, legal rights person. And actually, this person doesn't look too happy. Uh, this person's happy enough because she's getting most of her stuff. Two of the items aren't going into the backlog. So you can see some pink items on the backlog. And the, the Brexit dude is really fed up because he's only getting one item in the backlog. And actually, that one item, I've drawn a stick of dynamite there. Um, uh, and that's my visualization of, of some kind of delivery risk. So usually when there's some kind of delivery risk, that item in the backlog, I mm, need to move that up higher to, to kind of tease that out because if that's what, maybe we can do a metaphorical controlled explosion to see if we can manage that risk a bit better. Because what the last thing we want is to be running for uh, 10, 11 months. It did actually happen to me in 2013. Shame on me. Team went on for 11 months and uh, there was a director's bonuses hanging off the, uh, the vision being delivered. And we found out the design didn't work about three weeks before Christmas. No pressure. To get around it, I'm curious what kind of technical that was delivered. Uh, but anyway, uh, sticks of dynamite. Try to visualize them. Try not to do what I do. Try not to be, you know, believe what you hear. Also, maybe do a little bit of verification as well. Um, so I believe in trust and verify as opposed to trusting blindly. That's just a John Coleman comment. Uh, you please feel free to disassociate your, <laughs> disassociate yourself, disassociate yourself from, from my beliefs. Um, so in this case, you've got the the, the COVID nineteen items in there. You've got the right items, the legal regs items, and you've only got one blue item in the backlog. So, so what's happening here is that how we deal with projects is the product owner is basically, I don't want to say the word negotiating, uh, it's the wrong word, but basically is uh, massaging egos and making, trying to do the best they can. Even some of these customers, uh, that customer's are kind of happy, that customer's kind of happy, this one's kind of miserable. Uh, you try to keep everybody happy, nobody's happy. So, you know, you have to make some decisions. And one of the most difficult jobs for the product owner is basically saying no. So say no to some of these items. And it could get worse, actually, because we know that when there's a sprint review, new ideas come in, and ideas are usually much better than the old ideas. And so what we like to do is we like to have a self-organizing uh, team, um, selecting more from the product backlog in, in consultation with the owner, towards the sprint goal, the sprint goal iterating towards the vision. Um, and that's how this project gets done. And, and, and this team is the cross-functional, cross-skilled, multi-learning team. And uh, that's how we like to deal with it. So when there's product backlog refinement going on, there's a kind of, I won't say a recommendation, but it says in the Scrum Guide, uh, a, a team will spend usually less than 10%. They could spend 90%, they could spend 40%, 5%. Uh, but uh, a lot of good teams will use product backlog refinement to avoid sprint planning being a car crash, uh, so you're kind of prepared. Um, 
prepared to as a failure to prepare fail and prepare to fail. Um, but some teams don't bother doing that. But it's um, if uh, teams are trying to clarify the problems that these people are trying to solve, they will talk to these project managers and maybe they're the stakeholders that they're dealing with more importantly uh, to avoid the broken telephone, Chinese whisper, you want to call it, it's kind of a metaphor for the, the message breaking down when, when you send this, a message between a string of people, if the message gets distorted. You probably heard, uh, probably heard of that before. So that's how we like to deal with projects in Scrum. So just want to check on the comments and see how things are doing. And you're already quite there at the moment. That's okay. If you've got any any questions, uh, there's no dumb questions here. So any any questions, just uh, please feel free to, to go ahead. So I've mentioned about how we deal with projects. Now I just want to just kind of get into Scrum a little bit. So we've already highlighted there's a product backlog here. The product owner is managing the the optimizing this product backlog for the maximum value. So the team is getting the highest value stuff, and we're getting a valuable increment at the end of every sprint. Uh, increment is the, basically the product. Increment, uh, sorry, the, it's the product, the latest version of the product. Um, and uh, when items uh, are selected uh, for a sprint, because in Scrum we have these time boxes of one to four weeks, when you select work, that these items are no longer on the product backlog. Uh, they're removed from the product backlog, and they're now in the they're now actually in the sprint backlog, if you like. Well, actually, they're in the forecast, more, to be more accurate. You've got the forecast here. So these are the items in the sprint. And the color here is reflecting the source of the work. So there's two customer and user items. There's a COVID-19 item in there. There's a legal and regs item. And there's actually, actually there's a Brexit item in there as well. So the Brexit guy didn't do so badly because actually there's one item already in progress. And this is a, a scrum board a visualization of a spring backlog. So they've broken down each of these items into tasks. You don't have to do that, but it's a kind of a typical pattern that you see. And you can see in this case that um, the first item is uh, uh, a few items, a few tasks are done, but that item isn't done yet. So I'm not really happy with this team because I'd prefer if they had maybe focused on one or two items and just got, them, got everything done and then they could focus on the next few items. But anyway, you don't have to do that. You, you can deliver stuff at the end of a sprint if you want to. So in Scrum, we have a sprint backlog. That's essentially, uh, you've got the forecast, you've got your visualization of the sprint backlog. Uh, head, uh, that's basically heading towards the sprint goal, which is hopefully heading towards the, the vision. And uh, the team is self-organizing, or in large scale Scrum, we try to emphasize the word self-managing. Self-managing team um, is uh, doing that work according to their definition of done. They've got a I don't want to call it a checklist, um, uh, although I have seen teams do it that way, but it's kind of like, you know, there's some technical considerations. There's uh, some product quality considerations. So when you say that these items are done, are all these items ticked because maybe you haven't done all the testing or you haven't managed the brand um, affinity, for example, if you're in marketing. Um, so, uh, there's a, it's kind of it's kind of like a checklist in a, in a sense, but I, I don't like that expression. It's kind of like a reminder. When we say something is done, this is what we mean. This is what we mean. Um, and so the the team will be aspiring. Uh, they're, well, they're not just aspiring. They're committing to the Scrum values of focus, openness, courage, commitment, and respect. And also they're they're committing to empiricism. The three pillars of empiricism are transparency, inspection, and adaptation. We get the inspection and adaptation from having sprints and um, inspecting the uh, how the sprint went, inspecting the increment, and inspecting the team. There's different events, you inspect different things, um, and inspecting your progress towards a goal and so on. Uh, and the, these three pillars are, uh, are important for empiricism. And one of the things that I don't like seeing is when there's a lack of transparency, when, there's a, when transparency is suboptimal, you're basically weakening your ability to build evidence uh, that allows you to decide better what to do next. Because uh, that's basically what empiricism means. You're basically using an evidence-based approach and you're kind of deciding what to do next based on what you did uh, last. Um, so just checking the comments here again, just to make sure everything's okay. Everyone seems to be okay so far. Um, so if I just stand back and look at this, uh, in scrum.org what we say is that if you were to say scrum in two words, you'd say, uh, done increment, and that's kind of that's not a bad way of doing it. Other people would say it's about learning and so on, but it's not a bad uh, effort at trying to put scrum in two words. 
Because what happens a lot of the time when people aren't doing Scrum, definition of done is a concept that gets kind of de-emphasized. And a lot of, that will happen a lot when you're doing we call what we call a zombie scrum or uh, wagile water scrum fall, the combination of waterfall and scrum. And, and um, basically what happens when you do that is that this whole concept, which is not a strong concept, is not a concept at all in waterfall, it doesn't get understood. So quality kind of goes out the window a little bit and we, we, uh, we lose the benefit. So I like the idea of the, the focus on the definition of done. Uh, and making sure that when we when we ship something, that improves transparency as well. Because when we say something's done, we we know we've done all these checks against the brand or uh, the visual design or the uh, technical standards or whatever it is that we're uh, we are in our list of uh, getting uh, things uh, done around here. In the actual sprint itself, uh, one to four weeks, we've got these events. We've got uh, sprint planning. Uh, you've got the daily scrum. We don't call it the daily stand up. Please don't call it the daily stand up. Um, uh, the sprint review, the sprint retrospective. Um, and uh, also, uh, if I was to say something else that's really important, probably something I should have said at the start scrum is for complex product development. This is a, some people might recognize this as the Kinevan sense making framework. Scrum is on the kind of liminal uh, between the complicated and complex, more on the um, more on the kind of uh, the compl uh, the com it's on the complex side, but it's just barely in the border, if you like, like between complicated and complex. Um, so Scrum is for complex work. Uh, you can get to do even more complex work if you combine Scrum with some advanced UX techniques, uh, Lean UX, and bring it in even more deep uh, uh, if you want if you want to do that. Uh, but also Scrum is about empiricism. So when I see people with uh, with plans where they, they know what, let's say we're in sprint one and they know already what we're going to do in sprint 13. That by definition explains to me that uh, the stakeholders don't understand empiricism because, it, because actually when we deliver something in a sprint, uh, the stakeholders, customers, end users uh, will review the increment. Uh, there might be new insights from the market, maybe the whole market changed during the sprint. And uh, and so we, we need to be able to, uh, need to be able to adapt to that. So we, we need, to be very adaptable for new changes coming into the product backlog. And this is why we don't like teams. You can notice here in the product backlog, we don't like teams doing lots of analysis and the items that are lowered on the backlog. It's actually just a waste of energy because if you think about it, that product backlog is kind of like a stack of plates in a, 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 a what you call it in a kind of restaurant where you get side stored and you get the plates, you kind of pick up your own plate, you get your breakfast or whatever. Uh, it's kind of like that. The new ideas go at the top, and so the old ideas get pushed down, don't they? And so there's almost like a natural water line below, which uh, which is a moving water line as well as the more stuff comes in, the stack is, is going up, I guess. And so these old ideas, uh, the product owner might have to have more conversations with these people saying, sorry, you're not going to get that either, you're not going to get that, you're not going to get that. And they're not trying to disappoint them because actually the new ideas in these people are agreed as being more important than the old ideas. So empiricism is about adapting to change, it's about embracing uncertainty, which makes forecasting very difficult. Uh, but there are some lovely techniques um, and my favorite technique for forecasting is Monte Carlo probabilistic forecasting. I did another live stream on that. So if you just check the channel that you're in, you'll be able to see another video on Monte Carlo probabilistic uh, forecasting. Um, okay, so that's Scrum. Um, you got a product owner. I, I never talked about the poor Scrum master. <laughs> the Scrum master supporting the product owner, supporting the, uh, the development team and supporting the organization. Um, you've got a definition of done, which is absolutely critical. You've got the scrum values, the, the three pillars of empiricism, team is delivering an increment every sprint, ideally a cross-functional uh, whole product focused team delivering a slice of cake. But actually in the scrum guide, it doesn't kind of say it so much, but you could this team could be delivering a layer of cake. So what I want to get on to next is when I have people coming into whatever organization I'm working on and they're doing scrum training, or they're doing coaching or whatever it is, I want them to be teaching or coaching about less friendly Scrum, not their version of Scrum. They might be coming from SAFE, they might be coming from uh, Scrum at Scale, McKinsey, wherever. Uh, I'm not saying any of those are bad. In fact, I did, a, I think I mentioned earlier, I did a comparison of all these frameworks and you can pick which one you want, you want based on whichever vector is more important to you. But if I'm working in an organization, I'll probably be using a large-scale scrum-friendly lens 
that doesn't mean that you have to use Scrum. Uh, that's my opinion. You can also do Kanban for complexity as a method I wrote last year that will, uh, that's pretty compatible with large scale Scrum as well, even though large scale Scrum is called large scale Scrum. Uh, but I want to highlight next what's different uh, about less friendly Scrum from bog standard Scrum, shall we say. Um, I mentioned earlier on that, from, in my opinion, you could drive a bus through the Scrum Guide. Well, that's uh, If you're not familiar with that expression, it kind of means uh, there's a lot of gaps that are really open to interpretation. And if you come at, at the Scrum Guide from a different mental model, you could understand it a different way. And that's what I want to tease out. A little bit of surgery on the on Scrum and look at you know what would be what would be so different? You know, isn't Scrum something? Isn't it a commodity these days? Can I can I just go to any Scrum Alliance trainer or Scrum Dog trainer? And uh, you know, it's uh, we can we can be certified Scrum masters, certified product owners, professional Scrum product owner, whatever. Uh, pick your certification. Uh, surely I can just get these companies in, and we're good, right? That's it. We don't. Uh, and I say, actually, no, no, um, because and I've. And I notice it almost in every organization that I go into that trainers and coaches who come in um, actually undo a lot of my work. They undo my work. They unravel my work. And so if I'm in an organization quite early in the change, I try try to make a case for, you know, if we're going to get Scrum training done, can we, do, can we get less friendly Scrum training? Because particularly if I have some influence in the organization, if I don't, of course, no one will care. But if I do have influence, um, then I would like my work not to be undone as with the people who are supporting me because they're giving me that influence. Um, so that's what I want to talk about uh, next. And the first thing I would mention is that in Scrum, um, it's in the Scrum Guide anyway, there is only one product owner. There's one product owner, one product owner for the entire product. And uh, I do not support, and Les does not support, the idea of a product owner at a team level. Now, some of you might be horrified. This, how, how, how can you manage all this? We need some, we need some business domain knowledge in the team. And I say, yes, you, 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 you probably do. Um, but that person, that skill, could be another person in the development team. When we say we've got a cross-functional team, that doesn't mean that they're just a technical team with the technical skills to deliver the income, to deliver the product, to deliver the, the new packaging for your product or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, the business domain knowledge can actually be in the development team. It, in fact, I would say it should be in the development team. So some people get confused by one of the uh, Agile Manifesto principles. Uh, they don't like the idea of uh, business people and um, people on the development teams in Scrum working together every day. Because they think, uh, oh, uh, we need to go to the business people every day. It's going to be so annoying. And not, no, no, actually, they're working with them every day. They're in the team. They're in the team. Um, so you don't need to have a team product owner. And there's, there's a problem. Michael James did a fantastic video on this. I'll put the links uh, on the comments at the end of this. He did two fabulous videos. He's got a new draft video as well, which is very good. And essentially, if you have different teams, so let's say this team, this is team A, and there's another team, team X. Uh, this team here is working on the, I don't know, they're working on this item here, and it's worth, say, $2,000. Uh, but there's another team, team X. Uh, but all they can do is, uh, because they don't have uh, slice of cake teams, they've got layer of cake teams, uh, they're actually working on this item down here, because this is actually all they can do. They, they can only work on the $2 item down here. And by the way, this other team, Team X, that's at the top of their backlog. There is only one product backlog, but one thing that a lot of teams do, particularly with electronic tools, is that we have one product backlog, but actually each team is only looking at their own filter of the backlog. So Team X is just looking at this, and they're working on the $2 item. Uh, this team here can't even afford to work on the $1,500 item. And uh, if you had a, a, a whole product view, you would see that it's nonsense that we're working down here. Why should, surely, even though we have to run your skills, we should really be up here. It might be uh, less efficient in the short term, but more effective and more efficient in the long term because surely the, uh, Team X should be working up here, helping Team A. 
to get the next item done. So that's one of the reasons we don't like having team product owners. That's the first big change, one product owner. And uh, as well as that, um, that product owner will have one product backlog. And uh, we then expect as a natural kind of uh, correlation, I suppose, that the development team, uh, they will have a lot of delegated responsibility from the product owner to, um, to refine this product backlog, to understand it, to talk to the customers and end users, to talk to these project managers over here, to talk to their stakeholders, to understand the problems that they're trying to solve. Because actually we want the teams to build a business to their knowledge so they can be a really flexible team, not just really good with um, the technical domain, uh, delivering a technical size of cake, but also broadening their business uh, domain knowledge. So that's the first key difference, one product owner. And uh, even in the less huge framework, there is still one product owner. Uh, less huge is um, roughly for a situation where you've got more than eight teams. Uh, but it could be 13 teams this big. You should stick with the less framework until the product owner's head hurts. And, and then when their head is hurting, then you go to less huge. The less, less huge has uh, areas. So you've got different uh, areas of the product. Um, uh, but each area has a minimum of four teams. And we don't want a situation where, oh, yeah, they're in this area, one team, this all, you know, so the, all you're doing is just rebadging, relabeling, putting lipstick on a page. So with large scale Scrum, it's still one product owner. And even with the area owners that the product owner working with across the product, the product owner is just the first among equals. Uh, the product owner isn't like a, a, um, isn't their superior as such. So still just one product owner, even with less huge, even across thousands of people, because we're actually delegating a lot of the responsibility for understanding the product and broadening our, our understanding of the whole product to the to the teams. That leads to a second uh, difference. I see a comment coming there from Mike Levins. I'll be with you there in a second, Mike. Uh, another key difference as well. So uh, obviously, if I'm teaching um, Sprog Scrum, that's consistent. One product owner, absolutely. Uh, Nexus is the same as one product owner. Um, and uh, Scrum is Scrum, right? But uh, one of the things I would say as well is that when you start using large scale scrum, if you are you only use large scale scrum when you're in a scaling situation, uh, when you've got multiple teams. And if you did have multiple teams, um, there is no development team. We just call this team. It's, it's called team, not development team. And actually, large scale scrum is multi team scrum. So there are multiple teams working with a number of scrum masters and product owner. And actually, the 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 Obama mic drop uh, piece here is that there is no scrum team unless there is no scrum team in large scale scrum. There is multi multi team scrum. There are multiple teams doing work. There is a one product owner, and there are scrum masters. But there isn't this concept of a scrum team. That we de-emphasize it unless is because of this disease that we see of people thinking that every team needs to have their own dedicated product owner. Because uh, that's causing the problem that we talked about earlier, where you're, you're delivering the wrong value. You can't even see here that you could be helping people over here. So I'm just going to check one of the comments here because I've got a got a comment here from uh, Mike Levings. Um, uh, thank you so much. And I've also got a comment. Another, I've got a couple of more comments as well from Matthew. I'm going to come back to Matthew as well shortly. Uh, so Mike, um, one product owner. Does that mean a BA is useful, or, or does having a BA lessen the team's acquisition of business knowledge? True customer interaction, VA may go away and get this knowledge without the team. A uh, really good question, Mike. So, uh, one of my, uh, one of the best professionals that I worked with actually was a BA, uh, uh, very good guy, and he was really really good. He was he was almost too good. Um, I I don't mind. Uh, we we do need skills for the team. So actually, we need technical writing skills. We need testing. We need UX. We need brand. Um, uh, we need analysis skills, we need uh, ability to talk to customer skills, um, all sorts of skills are needed in a team, including analysis. But what we don't necessarily need is another person who just does what they do, you know. So, another person, and this is all I do, that's it, you know, I won't learn anything else. You can see here that these other people, the black skill here actually is learning some purple skill, 
the kind of orange amber here is learning some purple skill as well the purple is learning some orange skill and the yellow person is learning uh purple and uh, amber and you could do more so basically there's an expectation on our scale strong that you kind of amp up the multi-learning so it's okay to be a business analyst the expectation is for you to to not be a business analyst is for you to be a member of the team who's delivering work and you're doing whatever is needed to help to deliver the income so it means you're going to be learning some additional skills um so no problem with that what i do have a problem with though mike is a business analyst being a team product owner i think that's a disaster because then what's happening is you're uh, you're removing responsibility from the team for having a good product backlog and from even understanding the backlog. So even if I have, even that brilliant business analyst I worked with a few years ago when I was in an oil company, and even when I was working with him, and, and so if he did all that beautiful, he understood the customer and he came along, um, the team still wouldn't understand the item. Um, so there are some techniques, of course, you can use story mapping and impact mapping. So the business analysts, and all, but as such, we don't like coordinating roles. We don't like proxies. We don't like, you know, uh, someone else is going to talk to the customer. So, uh, you know, uh, we will be the filter kind of thing. We don't like that kind of concept. Um, so still, uh, still definitely a place. In fact, you'll see in the scrum test on the large scale scrum website that business analysis skills are needed. It's just that they're implemented in a different way, not as a, a team product owner. In fact, one of the questions I ask when I join or join organizations is, is there a career path to become a product owner? Like, you know, product owner, chief product owner, chief, chief product owner, if there is, it's kind of a smell. And I get more worried when people get paid for that role because it means I can't get rid of it. Um, and because we really only need one product owner. So no problem at all having BA skills, as long as you're learning other skills as well. Uh, Mike, uh, maybe some UX, maybe some testing. Uh, you're becoming more rounded as an individual. We call it multi-learning. In fact, multi-learning is something that was in the original paper of the new new product development game that never really kind of made it into the Scrum Guide. All we have is references to uh, cross-functional teams, but not so much talk about how that happens, and less is a bit more vocal on that front. So I'm just checking how I answered your question. Uh, BA may go away and get this knowledge without the team. I know I prefer that the team is interacting with the customer. Less prefers that. So this team will be talking to these customers and end users, talking to these project managers and their stakeholders to clarify the problem they're trying to solve because of the because instead of doing the wrong thing righter and being wronger, as Russell Lakoff said earlier, um, we, we try to make sure we're working on the right thing. We have the correct understanding of it. And we might come up with even a simpler way of addressing the problem because if you have a a BA sometimes a really good BA won't come up with a solution, but sometimes there's a tendency to come up with an architecture on behalf of the team, and that reduces the health as well. And that we want the team to be really self managing. There are no coordinating roles in large scale Scrum. I hope that answers your question, Mike. And come back to me if I haven't answered your question. Uh, just going to back to Matthew. Um, a few comments, thank you, Matthew, little brother, indeed. Uh, and uh, based on the empiricism statement that Scrum has. It might be jumping to go on. Perhaps do we uh, have less friendly Kanban? I hope I have, uh, Matthew. So uh, I did a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago on Kanban for complexity, which looks remarkably like um, Scrum, except it doesn't have a Scrum master, it doesn't have a product owner. In my view, Scrum has been a bit destroyed by having those roles because they've become abused. And uh, uh, team product owners, for example, and Scrum masters who are acting as coordinators when they shouldn't be coordinators. Um, so I almost prefer not to have those roles in cases where the teams uh, actually want to use Kanban, where the belief system is more towards Kanban. Um, and anyway, Kanban doesn't have those roles anyhow. So I hope that answers that question, uh, Matthew. So uh, the, the large sales community will have to judge whether it's less friendly or not. But being a less friendly trainer myself, I did my best when I was designing Kanban for complexity to make it as less friendly as possible. And I actually made direct references to less in that. So you'll find that at kanbanguys.org. So we just type in the URL here, HTTPS. Um, I uh, typed the URL in wrong. I never learned how to type properly when I was in college. Bye, John. Uh, Kanban. Guides. Org. Just like there's uh, Scrum Guides. Org, there's Kanban Guides. Org. So just uh, drop that URL on the comments window as well. Um, and Matthew said I answered his other question. Uh, thank you. Uh, another one here from Matthew. Right. In fact, the Scrum is a single product owner, Synergy with Less, absolutely. And also Nexus. Nexus and Less have that in common, uh, that uh, there is one product owner. Scrum.org 
Scrum, it would be very, very compatible really with uh, large scale Scrum. It wasn't really difficult for me uh, to, to, but you do have to, um, uh, you just have to be careful about uh, certain things where, there, where there's conflict, which, I, which I'm going to get on during the rest of my presentation. Uh, got some more comments here as well. Uh, Rudiger, uh, Rudiger, you were on a few weeks ago. Thank you. You helped me out when we were doing a Kanban simulation. So the same goes for UX, UI, resource skills. These guys spend time, the customers figure out a problem. Yeah, I also gave um, three talks on UX uh, recently. Joshua Seiden was there. Maybe you saw a couple of those talks, Rudiger, as well. Uh, and I also did, um, uh, I worked on the Lean UX canvas with friends, and we were talking about COVID-19. Uh, but what you do with COVID-19 and the whole Lean UX might help um, with lots of health warnings um, at the start of the talk, because we didn't want to be saying we're going to be solving things with magic. Uh, but in large-scale Scrum, actually, one of the things that a lot of the large-scale Scrum-friendly trainers and the certified less trainers would say is, why do we even need Scrum with UX workshops? Uh, surely UX should be part of the team anyway, and those those UX skills should be just right inside here, inside the team. Absolutely true. It's just the, the, the reason that the course exists, Scrum with UX, is because so many people misunderstand that. They put UX people in separate center of excellence away from the teams, and then it becomes like a one-off design, and then these teams are just receiving widgets. And, and actually, it's less about UX than it's more about UI, which is a bit of a pity. UX people can um, really help um, uh, the, the product owner, but actually in the UX workshop, what we teach is that we want, if there's a UXer in there, let's say the uh, red person here is a UXer, we expect the UXer to be teaching other people on the team all things UX. And the other people will never be as good at UX probably, but there's certain things they could do like customer interviews, maybe write interview scripts, uh, doing prototypes and so on and so forth. So uh, we do have a solution for that. And there's three talks on this channel, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. Um, whichever channel you came through, you'll see recordings of previous talks and that as well. So let me know, uh, Rudiger, if I answered your question. And thank you very much for your for your comment. And yeah, it's uh, yeah, complexity. That's right. Um, complexity is uh, Kanban for complexity. Complexity for short looks remarkably like Scrum, um, and it's based on Kinevan. Um, so we there's a lot of attribution to the Kinevan sets wiki framework. I will be doing a fresh update because of the uh, Saint David series uh, that Dave Soden does every year. There are some pending updates. They're not official in Kinevan yet, but uh, I'm going to preempt the changes and uh, put them into the a new version of that guide within the next few weeks, Matthew. So keep an eye out for that as well. Okay. So thank you for your comments. I'm going to go back now to uh, to the board and talk about some of the remaining differences between bog standard Scrum, as we say in Ireland, and you can tell my accent is Irish, bog standard Scrum, plain vanilla Scrum, if you like, and as we scrum. So we already, talk, already talked about one product owner. We talked about uh, the teams being multi-learning, although you will see that in, in Scrum as well, but it's really enforced messaging and uh, enforces the wrong word, but encouraged, strongly encouraged multi-learning in, in large-scale Scrum. Uh, these, uh, if you're in a multi-team context, these are called teams or in the development team. Uh, the Scrum master in bog standard or vanilla Scrum, in the Scrum guide, you could have a part-time Scrum master. Uh, you could have. I'm, I'm not a fan of it. Personally, I'm not a fan of that. Because uh, what happens then is these people kind of take turns, you know, who's doing the Scrum Master next week kind of thing. And uh, it's not something that they're really inspired about. Unless they, unless the company has a career path that they can, the organization has a career path, they can go on to become some super duper Scrum Master or super, super duper Scrum Master um, uh, kind of path. But if, this, if, if we're just treating it as a part-time role, uh, really, their career path would be for their specific product development skills and not their Scrum Mastery skills. So we prefer the Scrum Masters to be full-time, full-time. Uh, and you might be saying, well, that's a bit expensive. Yeah, well, uh, Scrum does help you to be more efficient, but in order to get there, you need to be more effective. To be more effective, look at any football team, look at any tennis player, they have coaches, right? So the coaching stance isn't the only stance of a Scrum Master. There are other stances, teaching, mentoring, coaching, coach ask questions mentor and gives answers, uh, removing some impediments for the team, working with managers to fix problems in the system. Actually, that's another thing about um, uh, large-scale Scrum, that uh, the manager role is optional. It's a manager role. So there's a recognition that managers might be useful. How about that? Uh, it's optional. 
So if you don't have managers, you don't need to hire them, but if you have them, they can help to change the system. Because when we do the retrospective every sprint, there might be some issues that we can bring up with another kind of event called the overall retrospective, uh, where managers attend and they help us to, to fix problems in the system. So this is full time. Uh, I love Michael James' um, comment where he said, um, a good scrum master could deal with three teams, a great one can deal with one team. Um, so if you're spread out across 11 teams, um, I'm not sure how how well that's going, okay? So you might be very good, you might be very talented, uh, but just be careful there, okay? And typically for me, if there's one team launching, I'm probably not gonna, gonna have limited capacity to you know, have launched all the teams at the same time, so be careful. This is a full-time role, full-time role. And also, Bass Father's on the record, he wrote a blog post at less.works that he expects um, Scrum Masters to be technical. Um, he says it's not too late, even at my age, 51, it's not too late. Uh, because uh, there's all sorts of benefits, uh, more credibility with the team. Uh, you understand what they're talking about. Um, there's a danger as well, of course, that you might have an ego in terms of how technical you are. These people will probably always be better because they're doing it full time and you're doing Scrum Mastery. But I think you at least, you at least need to understand what they're talking about and know when there is a bit of BS going on. Um, and it, it just helps as well because you could be able to, if you're if you're a really good technical scrum after, um, your skill level will be higher than the team because you can actually coach the team on technical skills um, and help them to improve over time. So that's another key difference that even though technical excellence isn't mandatory in our skill scrum, it's strongly encouraged. I would also say that it's strongly encouraged that the scrum master is uh, is technical. Uh, just. Uh, Rudiger just came back there and he said uh, he'll check the previous videos. Thank you, Rudiger. If you can't find them as well, just write to me, John at ace.works. Um, you can, uh, I can uh, send on those links to you. Okay, thank you for that. Keep the questions coming. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so uh, the other thing is I mentioned earlier on that there are no coordinating roles in a large scale scrum. In fact, there are no coordinating roles in the scrum. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of people, depending on their lens, will think, oh, the Scrum Master will coordinate between the teams and manage the dependencies and basically act like an agile project manager. Uh -uh. No way, Jose. So what we expect in large-scale Scrum is the coordination strategy is just talk to each other. Go and talk to each other. And you should be using, uh, if you're a software guy, you'll be using continuous integration anyhow. And, to, and hopefully you're using trunk-based development if you're software developers. So you can see when Betty or Mary has your code, the code you want to work on checked out. Maybe you compare with her and do the change together. You do branch, if you do branching, it just makes things very complicated. You can't actually have a product that's ready to go to the market because you need to suck everything in. Like a, I heard an expression Andy Carmichael gave me this expression. He said, there's an octopus merge. So you suck code from all the branches and smush it together. But last time I've seen teams do that, they lost weeks of code. Really expensive developers losing lots of code. Uh, for people who aren't into software development, uh, you don't need to worry about uh, that so much. But teams just talk to each other. Um, and there are some guides to support that. Like, for example, you can have travelers um, where uh, maybe I'll ask, is it OK if I join your team? So basically, I leave my previous team and join the other team. Um, and that's good because it, it might expand the technical knowledge in the team. Uh, but it could also expand the business knowledge in the team. Uh, this new person could bring in some cognitive diversity to help us solve problems in different ways. Um, now you might be saying, "Well, huh? you you allow people? I thought we I thought we had stable teams in Scrum. Like why why don't we? Uh, uh, why, why why do we allow travelers to join teams? But because it's very interesting the the, the research that Richard Hackman did that book that I referred to earlier on, leading teams. Uh, he noticed that. Teams over time, their performance improved. But in research and development, which is mostly what we do, whether you're marketing, sales, IT, or whatever you're doing, HR, um, we're doing R&D. We're, we're, we're using our brains, and we're doing R&D. And he couldn't understand why, but the research he did on US federal agencies showed that the performance of teams, when they get to four years old, we don't know why, but the performance just implodes. It just go, falls over a cliff. Now, you might be not worried about that because you're saying, you know, I won't, I won't even be here in four years. I'll be in a different company or whatever it is. Particularly if you've got a project mindset, you'll think like that. But if you are if you really have a product mindset, you're worried about the product and how your product is going to improve over time, uh, we'd like to delay that cliff edge. 
Um, so every time a, a new traveler joins, I wouldn't do it every week, right? We don't want teams changing every week, every sprint, every month, but maybe every six months or so, just just new blood into the team, you know, freshen things up and I kind of delay. Okay, there's a temporary dip, um, but uh, overall, it imp we, we're improving the, our understanding of the full backlog and teams are becoming more flexible, can work in uh, almost anything. So that kind of makes it a bit better. Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting thing. So basically travel, or also you can have um, scouts where you go to, you might visit other teams' daily scrums. Um, and there's lots of other guys, there's component mentors as well, where maybe for example, this person with this black skill, um, she can, uh, she's kind of the expert in that thing. And there's other teams also working on that, but the people who pick up the black skill, they're not so expert on it, but the, in fairness, when they're picking it up, they're doing it, they're, they're, they have the vulnerability to, to try to try to learn and uh, this person will be available to answer questions if they struggle so component mentor are not supervising but there to kind of help them to get better uh, coaching mentoring if you like helping teams to get better so so one product owner technical scrum master full-time scrum master when you're a multi-team scrum it's uh, you got teams as opposed to a scrum team and the coordination strategy is just talk there are no coordinating roles. There are no team product owners. Scrum masters do not do coordination in large scale scrum. And you might be thinking, oh, well, what do they do then? Well, we do, excuse me, we do a lot. We have to work with the organizational level. We work with the, supporting the product owner, quite a senior product owner, usually kind of an executive type role, um, supporting teams to get better, uh, watching what's going on across the piece. Uh, there's a lot of work, teaching, mentoring, coaching, uh, and I, I hear people say facilitation, but that just drives me nuts because a lot of people think this Scrum Master facilitates the events. Uh, in my book, the Scrum Master's only gig is the retrospective, and even then they might delegate that to the development team to take turns with that. I, I would hope that in, in really good Scrum, that the product owner is uh, facilitating topic one of, um, of sprint planning, where you agree the sprint goal. I would hope that the development team is facilitating topic two, where you create the sprint backlog. Uh, I would hope the team would just organize itself for its own activities, or own product backlog refinement. Product owner doesn't even need to be there. Product owner does not even need to be there. Product owner does not even need to be there. Yeah, to bring in customers, end users, whatever stakeholders, or clarify the problems directly with them. I hope the development team is facilitating their own event. I mean, why does the Scrum Master have to run them up for their own day? It's their meeting, right, for the next 24 hours. I hope the product owner is uh, given the product owners invited in the stakeholders to the sprint review. I hope it's the product owner's gig to kind of organize that. And uh, yeah, I think the retro is the only gig for the scrum master. That's just my personal view. Of course, it says in the scrum guide the scrum master will facilitate as requested or as needed. And my view is they will not be requested and they won't be needed because we've got self managing teams and no coordinating roles. And we've got scrum master to help them to get better. Our gig is to help people to get better help the teams to get better, help everyone to improve. And while we're doing Jira Jockey and Secretary and all this kind of stuff, we're not doing the big stuff, which is helping the organization to learn, help the organization to improve. Uh, see a few more comments coming in, so I'll just uh, just check them out. Uh, so I've got another comment here. Uh, by SM, I mean Scrum Master, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, there must have been another message that I missed. So maybe uh, um, I think the name is Eleonora Nelson Perclason. Um, I don't see your other comment. So if you want to send me another comment, I think it might have got clipped or something because I, I, I don't have the full context of your message. Um, so Matthew has another question. So Matthew, thank you for your question. What's your take on delivery managers? As you mentioned, dedicated scrum masters per team. How does less deal with governance across multiple teams? Okay, very good question. So uh, because we have self-managing teams, uh, there's no need for anybody to be on the hook. Uh, there's a scrum this scrum master isn't on the hook for delivery. The part is on the hook for delivery in terms of uh, delivering the right value, delivering the right stuff. These are on, on the, the teams are on the hook for delivering increments of high quality uh, uh, as, uh, as agreed with the product owner. Um, but there are no delivery managers in our scale scrum. So if delivery manager is part of your culture, you're probably more compatible with other frameworks like Scrum at Scale and Safe, where the Scrum Master is a coordinating role. And this is why I'm trying, you might be saying, 
why am I talking about this? Because actually, uh, depending on which framework, the, depending on the lens that your trainer is coming from, they might think that your Scrum Master is like a delivery manager, and unless they're not, uh, the, develop, the teams will manage their own development. Thank you very much. They'll manage their own delivery. And they'll self-organize and they'll just talk to each other. They don't need any way to coordinate. And if, if you're talking about compliance items, that's a good point, actually, because there might be a case, particularly when there's very heavy governance, there might be a case to have, and uh, I'm trying to find a different color here that, uh, that we'll actually be able to read. I'm trying to pick a green marker here. You might need some compliance skill on the team. That might be an art in itself, right? Um, but what I'm hoping is that the, the team will be picking that up, right? I'm also hoping that some of that compliance work, we just put an X on it so we show that there's some compliance in it. I would hope as well that the, uh, you'd have some, if there's some work that needs to be done in relation to compliance, when we deliver the product, it's not good enough that we've just, um, uh, that we've just uh, delivered the product back. Like, it also needs to be legal and needs to comply with the law and uh, what your internal standards and so on. Uh, ideally, those extra conditions are under the definition of done. Uh, failing that, if they're only specific for certain items, you might have specific items for compliance. But I would hope that the skills for compliance are within the team. So if you have some people who are very good at dealing with that, um, given that we need a cross-functional team, that skill is something that would be very useful in the in the in the team. Uh, it's just that we we don't want you to be a single skill specialist. We want you to be learning other skills just like everybody else on the team. So let me know, Matthew, if I haven't answered your question on that one. And just checking. Uh, yeah, so um, Eleanor, if you could uh, come back to me, because uh, I think what your first message might have got clipped off. I can't actually see uh, the first message. So MS, SM means Scrum Master. Thanks, uh, thanks, Matthew. Okay, cool. Okay, so getting back to this. Um, so one product owner, technical Scrum Master, full-time, Multi-learning team, slice of cake team, not a uh, layer of cake. Uh, Box standard scrum allows a layer, layer of cake, slice of cake. Mostly slice of cake teams. They just talk to each other. Um, all the key differences, uh, when, you've, when you have multi-team scrum, uh, the Nexus has a sprint goal, but the sprint goal gets de-emphasized in large-scale scrum for practical reasons, uh, even more so with less huge. It gets very difficult to be able to agree a goal um, in Kanban for complexity, I have this notion of a, a three to six month target condition. So you still aim for something, but maybe trying to aim for something within a one, two week sprint might be difficult across multiple teams. Nexus still has that because Nexus deals with up to nine teams, uh, less up to eight teams. Uh, Scrum is Scrum, so the sprint call is still there. It's just not as important and less as it would be um, in, in uh, vanilla, vanilla Scrum. Uh, other key differences as well, uh, if you have multi-team scrum, if you have multi-team scrum, multi-teams work in the same product, the sprint planning gets split up. So it's like uh, there's part one, part two, uh, whereas in the scrum guide, you've got topic one, topic two. Uh, the sprint itself as well in, in large-scale scrum, every team on the product has the same sprint length. Every team in the product has the same sprint length. Um, so uh, in Nexus, for example, you could have a, a four week sprint for the product, but some teams are spinning around in two weeks or one week sprints. But unless everybody's in the same same cadence, if you like, same rhythm, because um, if you think about it, if the four week team is trying to uh, just talk with people on the on a two week team uh, and they're in sprint planning, they can't just talk, right? So there's some practical reasons for that. Um, the retrospective itself. Um, is uh, there's a kind of a, a interesting there's an inter interesting techniques that you can bring into the retrospective uh, in the three day class uh, by Craig Larman we learn system modeling there's some of that as well in Basel's class Basel's class tends to be more aimed at the the huge and my no, I noticed it was more about huge less huge and uh, uh, Craig was more about the less framework um, but when you uh, in either case we can use it, um, additional techniques uh, from systems thinking like system modeling causal group diagrams. I did one only yesterday. It was very, very useful to understand the problem. It's kind of like a chain reaction of different considerations in our system that we were dealing with. And we kind of found some problems. We found some interventions that would help us maybe to, to get around that. So the retrospective, every team has their own retrospective. And then maybe 
uh, usually at the start of the following sprint, there might be an overall retrospective where uh, uh, if there's a manager or managers, they, they're they're getting involved in helping to improve the system, uh, help to get the help, help to make the system uh, better. Um, so overall, if I was to say, you know, what are the key differences? Um, you've got uh, one product owner. You've got a team that is cross-functional, not just in technical skills, but also in business skills. Uh, you've got scrum masters who are helping everyone to get better, the product owner, the teams, the organization. The teams just talk to each other. They don't rely on delivery managers or scrum masters or team product owners. There are no team product owners in scrum. There's uh, in, in our scale scrum. There is uh, uh, our scrum for that matter. In, in, um, in the product backlog, it's just one product backlog. And we, we don't have teams working off different filters. We're looking at one view. And so when the teams run product backlog refinement, we do a thing called multi-team refinement. So what happens is instead of just doing your, well, you could do single team refinement, you could refine the items that you're working on in your team. But we encourage the use of multi-team product backlog refinement where essentially uh, you're working with other teams in the same area of the product and you're trying to understand the work together. Uh, and also, you can uh, you can do you can do that across the whole product as well. Uh, but typically, uh, common areas of the product. And what I like to see as well is when you do product backlog refinement, that even if there's two or three teams working together, and there's say seven other teams, I like to see these two or three teams looking at the uh, the refinement that's been done by the other teams as well, and, and vice versa, so that we broaden our understanding of the product. Um, so the manager role as well is another thing I should highlight as a key difference because that's it's uh, it's it's accepted as well in Nexus to be fair with Scrum um, uh, It's just it's just codified a bit more in large scale Scrum. The role here is go see, go really see, fix problems, start rolling up your sleeves and helping teams to, to fix problems. Um, I think I've kind of summarised it now. Also, I think I mentioned in the previous uh, flip chart pages as well. There's a product focus. Uh, so if we just go back to those, just to kind of remind you about those. Um, so less about projects, more about products and customers. Less about specialists, more about teams that are learning. Less about resources and replaceable machine parts and robots, more about people. Less about layers of cake, more about slices of cake. Less about independent teams that don't need to talk to each other, more about cross-team cooperation and collaboration with a compelling direction with expert mentoring. Uh, less about coordinating to integrate and more about coordinating through integration and less about small fake products and more uh, more about a few um, few products that actually mean something to the customer. And if I bring it right back then to what, where I started, less is adopted top down and bottom up. It's key um, direction of travel is about adoptiveness, how can we respond to the market with a, with a whole product focus where managers really go see and fix the system, where everyone together tries to improve, expanding the definition of done, expanding the product definition, uh, learning more about the technical skills, also learning more about the business skills with no coordinating rules whatsoever, respecting people, and based on volunteering and technical excellence. So when I join organizations and I want to uh, get as close as I can to uh, large-scale Scrum, friendly Scrum, I like to be clear with suppliers and uh, other coaches that I'm interacting with that this is what I'm expecting. What I'm expecting is that when we go to uh, large-scale Scrum, uh, that we have what they, whoever is teaching Scrum in the organization, that they are actually um, they're making sure that we're delivering a, a lens on Scrum that is consistent with my work and it doesn't undo my work. Um, that is the end of my talk. I'm just going to check in now to see if there are more comments on the stream. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I uh, got a question here from Amani. I think Amani, have you been on a few talks recently? Hi, John. Uh, what's your take on big programs undertaking big complex work for their clients? And feel the need to hire specialist leads as a QA lead, senior lead developer, and so on. Not a huge fan of it. I'm just going to switch my camera back now, actually, so that you can see my face. Uh, so let me just turn the light down on the flip chart. Excuse me while I change the camera back and uh, get you a, get a view on, on uh, my ugly face. So let's go back to uh, looking at what's going on. So uh, thank you, Amani. So um, 
I'm not a fan of these coordinating anything that has coordinating roles is kind of missing the point. Uh, the other thing I'd say as well about large scale scrum is um, it's not so useful in a situation where you've outsourced everything. And uh, I don't mean long term suppliers. If you have long term suppliers that you have a relationship with, and you've got a five to ten year deal with them, you can you can improve together over time and. Uh, hopefully you won't screw the suppliers you know, when you got, want, want to get more work done, you build up, build up some trust. But if you're in a situation where like every six to nine months you're retendering for what work is going to be done in the next six to nine months, that lowers trust. And what it means is that we have these contracts between suppliers. Uh, so you got a test supplier, a development supplier, a UX supplier. It's just a disaster. Um, and so we, I try to unpick all of that. So if I see trainers coming in promoting this kind of thing or coaches promoting uh, where we need QA leads, uh, lead developers. All. I mean, you still need mentors, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, you still need, uh, people still need help, uh, but that, that doesn't mean that they need supervisors. Uh, so self-managing teams, inspired to deliver really good product. Uh, if you're in a world where uh, you, you really have uh, QA, leads, QA leads, tech leads, all that kind of stuff, where there's really a very strong hierarchy, um, less might not be the right pattern for you right now. That's not to say we can't get there at some point in the future. You, you could start with Kanban, for example, uh, with proper Kanban. Uh, I don't mean visual management, visualizing crap on a wall. I mean proper Kanban, Lim limiting work in progress so we deliver stuff uh, more efficiently, uh, even with the existing organization design. And slowly, slowly then I would try to de-emphasize these lead roles and actually have some of these people actually on teams uh, delivering stuff. So you can still have people who are senior. We're not saying you can't have senior people on teams. For example, you got product developer one, two, three, four, five, and maybe you get promoted by the number of skills you have and the number of skills you can coach other people on. But that doesn't mean that you're anybody else's boss, uh, if that makes sense. I hope I answered your question, Amani. Come back to me if I haven't. Uh, Matthew says, thank you. You're welcome, Matthew. Uh, final question from Matthew says, are teams volunteers? So the members of the teams are volunteers, Matthew. So if say uh, I do a workshop with say 35 people, right? And from what they heard so far about large scale scrum, they're kind of interested, but they're not really sure if they want to do it. Um, so they come through it and then they understand what it really is. And if they're uncomfortable, uh, usually the, the coach or trainer will pick up on that and encourage them not to be part of the change and stay doing what they're doing. Um, and I encourage people to be really open uh, about their level of discomfort because if they're not comfortable, uh, they probably shouldn't be part of the change. So let's have respect for the people who don't want to be in the change and have respect for the people who actually want to really go for it. Um, so yeah, it's the members, the team members. So when we have, sometimes when we do the self-designing team workshop, um, the teams will uh, self-design anyway. And so uh, those volunteers will end up in new teams anyhow. So I hope I answered that question there, but it's see more questions coming. Team members, yes, Matthew, yeah, team members. So yeah, they do volunteer. So they're not voluntold. Uh, we don't mean like, uh, uh, Matthew, uh, I want you to go into that. We don't mean that. Uh, it's like, um, uh, we're inviting people to be part of this. Uh, we look to run a workshop. You don't, uh, it's not like you have to sign up. It's not like you're joining some kind of culture when you join the workshop that you're expected to, to take it up afterwards. Uh, we prefer actually if you declare to us that this isn't for you and that's completely cool. You might like it later on. You might, you might not, you might just prefer to see how other people get on and if it works okay, then you're happy to join. Or you might decide never to join. That's okay too. Um, um, so um, yeah, there's something going on with the messages. Um, so um, I don't know. Oh, thank you very much for your comment, though. Uh, and if you have any other questions, uh, Leonora, just let me know. Thank you so much. Uh, Amani came back to me. She says she agrees with me. It's just changing the mindset of self-management. Absolutely. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, executives as well. And um, I have some questions uh, that I've blogged about and I'll be doing more blogging about. So I can kind of sense where the executives are and what they're ready for. And uh, sometimes they're not they're not ready for less, for example, or less when you scrum. Sometimes they're, and this is why other frameworks are kind of more popular at the moment uh, because uh, all they're ready for is maybe industrializing what they have and rebadging it. And I call it an office, an office move. Um, uh, the more things change, the more the more they stay the same kind of thing. Um, that's just a cynical comment for me, but um, yeah. So it is difficult changing the mindset, and 
And so what we'd like to do with large scale scrum is not only the team members, but also the managers, which managers want to be part of this as well, because managers have a role as well. Managers often have more power than scrum masters to remove impediments. That was one of the light bulb moments that I had at a three day class with uh, Baswada. I had 50 light bulb moments. I'd read the three books. I had 50 light bulb moments and I was locked out of the room for uh, two hours because at, at the time I was smoking and I uh, got locked out of the building and I think Baz was fed up with me. He thought I was being cheeky, but I was actually locked out of the building. So I probably would have had 60 light bulb moments if I, if I was there and I didn't miss that at this, didn't miss that hour. So thank you for that. And Manny says yes and thank you. And Matthew has another question. If they are so, uh, can we be more predictable with forecasting? If they're if they're volunteering, you mean, is it, Matthew? Yeah, I'm kind of, I am a bit skeptical about safe, um, but I wrote a blog post about it. Um, uh, when is safe safe? It corrupts Scrum, uh, but if you use it with proper Kanban, it's probably okay. Uh, that's basically what I said in the blog post. If you want to save yourself reading a blog post. Um, uh, it is improving, of course, over time, uh, and I don't judge people for using it because sometimes it's all you can do. Um, so I would never diss people for using it. It's just it's just not my preferred style. And if it's, if it's something that the organization wants, it's usually not something I want to be part of. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you for that uh, comment. And uh, Mike says, uh, lots of laugh, an office move, yeah. I actually got that uh, from a next colleague of mine from a previous gig, actually. So I have to thank him for that. I'll, I'll pass on the message that you like that. Um, so Matthew came back and says, if so, are they being more particular? Yeah. So are they more predictable? So this is interesting, right? Because we talked about uh, Ken Evan in a few of my talks, particularly the complexity talk, um, and also about, um, yeah, I, I did Lean UX, and I did a few talks, and pretty much every talk I was, I, I was introducing the unofficial, unauthorized guide to Ken Evan, and I'm doing a new version of that at the moment as well. Um, when we're doing complex work, our work isn't predictable by default, actually. It's not predictable. It is forecastable, and uh, hopefully all of our work isn't in the complex space. Hopefully, as we learn stuff through experiments, I forgot to talk, I didn't really talk enough about experiments. That's another key difference um, between less friendly Scrum and Scrum that actually uh, there's more experimentation. There's an expression, take a bite. You take a bite out of something to see see what happens. Is there value there? Is it does it work or whatever? Uh, more experimentation mindset you could have. Uh, that's also emphasized in the Scrum at UX workshop. But uh, would it be predictable? No, but we do encourage Monte Carlo. And I hope that a lot of your work is complicated, not that it's not all complex, because if the work is complex, it's basically unplannable. Um, uh, Monte Carlo helps for forecasting complicated work. And I was on a talk with uh, Gene General yesterday. I was, I was just uh, watching like everybody else. And uh, and uh, Dave asked my, answered my question. He said, uh, you don't do forecasting when you're in the complex space. You do side casting. And he said he just made that word up. What he meant was you take a side step and you decide what to do next. Um, but you can use this smoke and mirrors, but you can use Monte Carlo to help you. It's better than nothing. Let's put it that way. Um, so I hope that helps, uh, Matthew. Um, and then I've got another comment from Amani. Uh, yes, hearing a lot on safe and Bob. Yeah, Bob. I think Bob was... Um, he said he tried it, he gave it a chance, he was part of it, because, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and uh, he kind of threw in the towel on it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, Lean UX is now on the SIF diagram, but I think um, the authors of the Lean UX book, I don't, I don't think either of them were consulted about that. So, okay, hopefully they get more book sales. But, uh, I'm not sure how much thinking went into how Lean UX really fits within that. So it's like a box that you just put everything into. I'm not a fan of it. I'm not saying I'll never do it. Uh, sometimes you might need to do it. I just prefer not to be part of it. Um, okay, one final comment from Matthew. Great session. Uh, many thanks. And many thanks to you and all of you for your wonderful comments. I really appreciate I didn't think I'd be spending uh, one and three quarters talking about less friendly scrum, but there you are, right? I guess we covered a little bit of less, a bit of scrum, and then we finally got to what's the difference between less friendly scrum and scrum. Um, if you have any corrections you want to uh, write to me, if you're a less trainer yourself or less friendly trainer, you think I missed something, uh, add something to the comment window or just write to me directly. Uh, or anybody who's got a really, uh, good in-depth knowledge on less and you think I didn't say something quite right, uh, I'm here learning all the time. So I'd be delighted to get your feedback on what I could say better the next time if I'm explaining it. So uh, I'm going to give people one more minute to uh, 
give some comments but i think we're there now um and uh i'll just remind people as well that if they want to look at large-scale scrum there's a lovely website um uh less.works and it explains everything and there's also some wonderful videos if you go onto youtube and uh if you search less scrum you just less as you find everything but put in less scrum the first video like there's a dawson version pick the dawson version uh, it explains less than nine minutes and uh, also go to michael james youtube channel as well he's a he's kind of a less champion and uh, he's a less champion and a uh, great member of the community and he's put together a cartoon a comic uh, also some lovely videos explaining why it's really bad idea to have product owners he calls them team upper owners and he also explains some adoption mistakes that get made a lot of thinking mistakes by a lot of agile coaches out there and um, so he explains a lot of that as well in his video so check that out as well on youtube um so one more comment as well uh from mike um uh thanks john for this and obviously you're welcome mike i hope uh, i hope i'm kind of removing some of the boredom i'm sorry i did this on a, a very sunny day in london uh hope it's sunny wherever you are as well it's probably yeah, it's super dark getting dark, dark now in london it was sunny when i started but uh thank you very much everyone for watching this and for continuing to uh watch these live streams we'll have um tame flow coming up in on uh, a couple of weeks time steve tendon from tame flow is going to talk to us about tame flow it's a combination of Kanban and Theory of Constraints. So uh, please check that out um, uh, on Lean Product Delivery and the Lean UX, uh, London, uh, sorry, Lean UX London and Less Meetup Baku uh, Meetup Groups. Ch please check those out uh, for future events. Okay, over and out. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a lovely weekend. Thank you, and end of your week. Bye-bye.